Yeah, thank you for the um, introduction, um, uh, Hanbil, and then um, also thank you for inviting me to um, the the AI Summer School uh, at Seoul National University. I'm really pleased to uh, meet you all virtually and um, share some of my recent work. Um, and uh, um, um, uh, yeah, it's um, unfortunate that um, I couldn't uh, visit Korea in person. Um, I would have really loved to visit there and then um, meet you guys in person and then talk about interesting um, things. So, um, but hopefully we can still use this time to kind of um, talk about um, some, you know, potentially interesting problems for you and for me and then, um, take that as an opportunity to kind of uh, think about where we can um, go forward. So, um, so I'm currently uh, yeah principal engineer in autonomous vehicles at NVIDIA. So yeah, I just started uh, and also associate professor uh, in communication and statistics at UCLA. So I'm currently on leave from UCLA and then um, started a full-time um, role in industry. Um, and then, uh, um, so at NVIDIA, just to um, talk briefly, I am um, working on um, the, um, you know, essentially making self-driving cars. And then um, as some of you uh, may know, NVIDIA is um, um, you know, making uh, really end-to-end -end kind of full stack um, um, software and hardware solutions starting from uh, data collection and um, uh, simulation, synthetic data generation, rendering, model training, um, evaluation, and also deployment. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so there are many interesting opportunities. And then um, also our team is um, looking for, um, you know, either academic collaborations and also um, hiring interns or full-time positions. So if you're interested in um, exploring kind of further opportunities, um, please feel free to uh, let me know. Um, but the uh, today's talk will be mostly focused on um, the my research um, that has been done um, at UCLA mainly. Although of course there are um, kind of connected. Um, so the main research areas that I've been working on um, um, for uh, many years now um, are computer vision, machine learning. And, uh, um, and I guess um, probably most of you have some understanding of machine learning um, and also computer vision. And uh, um, so that's um, uh, you know, one um, main area of research uh, of mine. So um, I have done many work but, um, um, that has focused on um, kind of the, uh, um, some aspect of computer vision um, in some um, dimensions and um, the 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 um, the actual definition and the scope of computer vision itself is um, um, you know changing so it's not the same computer vision that um, um, I was studying uh, when I was a student but um, um, the um, I mean the key fundamental concepts and then the um, shared you know mode of thoughts and many things um, in computer vision is still there and then um, that's uh, uh, really interesting um, and to me and then um, I've been trying to um, kind of um, uh, expand the applicability and uh, uh, utility of those computer vision to um, other domains as well and then um, I'll want to talk about some of those things um, um, for today's talk. Um, the other areas also include um, human AI communication and intellection. Um, and then the, um, well, there are many different kinds of AIs that we're talking about here. And then it could be robots or it could be self-driving cars. It could be, um, you know, computation models, um, even some code, uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, or visualization, anything. Um, so we would, consider them as um, um, examples of AI. So how can humans um, communicate with those um, um, artifacts um, or, or something, the things that uh, we um, uh, crafted? And then um, how do we um, support and develop interface and language that facilitate the better and more intuitive intellection between humans and AIs? So that's another um, direction of my research. And then the third direction um, is um, broadly called computational social science and also social computing or, or anything um, that 
is focused on understanding human um, and social behavior, human and society uh, behavior using computational means and um, you know, research methodologies. That would be my third um, focus in research. And obviously, um, because I'm holding an appointment in the School of Social Science and Communications, that's a very important um, part of my work. Um, the, um, and um, I was um, <clears throat> also thinking um, while preparing for um, today's talk, um, I was also wondering um, how, um, the, what, what is the um, competition of the, the current audience for this talk? Uh, but um, um, as I understand, there are students coming from uh, different backgrounds, not necessarily just in computer science, but um, um, some um, students may come from um, other engineering um, programs or mathematics, or statistics, or even um, you know, social science and humanities. So, um, so if I could offer some opportunity for um, you know, those people, uh, who um, kind of wonder what would be the opportunity for um, you know, AI that will be applied to their own domain knowledge and expertise, um, then I'll be happy to share um, you know, some of my experience as well. So feel free to um, ask any questions at any point. Um, so the, um, um, I think um, yeah, you can either use the chat or um, just raise a hand or directly speak into your microphone. I am more than happy to stop and then um, talk more um, with uh, you all uh, whenever you have questions. So um, anything about um, either you're about career and development opportunities or anything specifically related to the um, topics of presentation. So um, it would be uh, much better um, that we um, make this session as interactive as possible rather than we um, kind of just talking all time. So, um, um, so hopefully, you know, um, there um, are some um, questions that I can um, take and answer during my talk. And um, yeah, so I went to um, Seoul National University, uh, and Columbia University and UCLA, um, all in computer science. So I was um, pretty much 100% um, engineer and computer scientist until um, I got my PhD and then um, made the transitioning to uh, the scope of social science and then kind of um, going um, uh, back to computer science. So I've been in many different places in um, engineering and also social science and also in, uh, in academia and industry. So um, I think that's um, uh, one of the unique um, aspect of my um, journey. Um, and, and hopefully um, that could be um, kind of interesting and, and um, also inspiring um, um, to some of you um, as you, I guess, are still kind of trying to decide what it uh, makes sense um, for you to kind of move forward. Um, any questions? No. Yes. All right. So we'll see. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so too much background um, before. Um, um, so okay. So the um, um, the uh, what we want to what I want to um, um, achieve um, the my research is essentially to answer this question. Um, so how do we really communicate with um, AIs? And then the um, again AI. There are many different kinds of AIs and many different levels of um, um, abstraction that we're. Uh, referring to here, so uh, many applications, robot systems, and also um, at fundamental level, there are models and codes and data sets and many things. So those are, um, you know, either AI or, um, you know, computing systems or resources that we can use and we should use in order to develop and, um, you know, use them, those um, um, AI systems. And then the way that we um, kind of intellect and um, um, communicate with AI is, um, uh, you know, there are many different ways. Um, and then the, um, the um, you know, ideally we could use um, human language, text, and also speech, and also facial expression, gestures, and many different things. Um, but I'm also, we could think of something like, you know, computer code software as a way to um, communicate 
with AI system, especially you know models and data. And what that means is um, um, we um, are using um, you know specific software to um, to give some comment to this computer system, and then the um, um, and then what we want to do is um, to um, train the machine learning models, and then we um, prepare the data set in a specific way. So you have a lot of um, um, data instances. Uh, labeled with um, some particular labels, and then the uh, we throw some objective function, and then um, you know try to uh, make that learning happen, and then deploy it. So that's kind of what um, you know computer scientists or AI researchers do. But um, um, so that is kind of model development. But I think that is also kind of communication activity. So here um, by communication, I mean you know uh, of course the exchange of information, and then we are. Um, exchanging information. We're sending the, our instructions to the computers and then the computers will give us back you know, data or models or model outputs. So there are very peculiar ways um, to, uh, for us to um, share and exchange those information. But um, um, they're not really natural or um, you know, intuitive. Um, and actually they're um, pretty limited, um, the bandwidth uh, and also, um, you know, uh, not flexible, and then the um, you know mathematical and logical, and then when you think of human communication, um, you know it just doesn't match uh, the same level of flexibility and creativity and novelty and many things. So the question that um, I want to answer, um, you know, eventually is um, so how can we make that learning and then. Um, um, you know, data collection or model development, everything um, can be done kind of more naturally and intuitively, such that uh, any normal people, normal humans, you know, I mean, regular um, human users without understanding of computer science or machine learning can steal um, intellect with any AI systems. So, um, the communication. So, um, you know, since I am in the discipline of communication, also the communication itself is very important topic. So, uh, what is communication? So, how can we define communication? And this is um, um, a sentence that I took from Wikipedia. So, you search uh, communication, and this sentence is um, um, the first sentence. Um, and then it, it sounds like definition communication is an apparent answer to the painful divisions between self and other, private and public, and inner thought and other uh, outer world. So, um, you know, that, uh, is it a definition or, or um, something else? Uh, but um, uh, what does that really mean? Um, so that's not very um, um, common way for us engineers to define a certain concept. It's a more of a description or characterization of certain concept, uh, but it, is um, actually more helpful um, and, and um, more useful to understand uh, what we want to understand, uh, which is communication. And then the literal definition of communication is, of course, the exchange of information. You pass information, and then you get it, and then using some you know, vocabulary, and then you decode the meaning of speakers and understand uh, what they try to communicate. That's just the um, kind of the surface level understanding of communication. So it's much deeper um, than that, and in, uh, in the sense that you know we um, and then the, also the the part of definition um, given in Wikipedia will try to um, you know uh, empathize. Actually, communication is mandatory and really essential part of human lives. So it's something that we have to do in order to um, carry on our lives and then the, uh, you know, the achieve our goals. And then uh, we have to do this kind of thing because um, we are separate instances. We're separate in, uh, the entities and then we don't share our feelings and thoughts automatically because we're disconnected. So we have to do certain things um, in order to um, kind of share the knowledges or skills or information or whatever. And, and those things that we do in order to um, overcome this physical and mental constraint. And in this case, this constraint is the fact that we are separate entities it is called communication. So it's much broader than just speaking or writing, um, you know, singing. Um, so those are just kind of surface level activities that we do. But um, in my opinion, what's more important 
to understand what communication really is, is um, uh, what we try to achieve by those communication, and also why we actually have to do it. Um, and then the um, and then that I think um, is um, uh, kind of um, uh, can give us um, you know better you know insight or sense of what. Uh, we should study, and then how we can also potentially combine the um, you know, human communication and also AI research um, as a potential next steps. So um, you know the there are many um, research questions and sub areas in communication, and then I, I'm actually not going into uh, you know this you know, disciplinary um, knowledge or, or anything in communication. And actually, I'm not familiar with uh, many of those um, um, areas myself. So, um, but uh, um, the, the field is actually very interesting. And then the, um, it's, um, I, I, I'm almost certain that no matter what you think about communication uh, as a discipline, what they do um, um, is actually different from what you think they do. So uh, one example that I um, picked up, and I thought this was a uh, you know interesting example because this is kind of just um, you know got um, you know became viral in um, you know media. So uh, what it is um, is that you know those are the zoomed in photographs taken by journalists in Congress. Those are politicians use their smartphones and then um, you know, they talk to their colleagues or president or party leader or whatever. And then the, um, they're, the, the journalists and then the media trying to kind of um, leak the um, private conversation to the public audience. And then, um, you know, and then the, uh, I guess um, probably a lot of you are familiar with um, what uh, uh, the, the most recent one, but, um, the, um, I, I am actually not going to talk about the actual content of those messages, but um, um, I want to talk about what is happening um, uh, in those situations uh, because um, you can easily tell there is um, very um, similar um, patterns of um, you know visual depictions here. And then, so why is it? interesting and then why did it actually make a huge splash on media was um, because of the fact that the um, what what we see through the screen is um, the um, private conversation so it is confidential content um, shared between um, these people right the the people holding the smartphones and then the other person um, that we don't see but we know who they are and then we um, get to see the content. And that's interesting because um, uh, when you think of the um, private messengers and confidential um, communication, then um, you, know, you may think that's um, um, kind of more weird rather than you know, fake because um, you, know, you may have um, less reason to be um, you know, uh, political or diplomatic and then um, you don't have to hide um, certain things, so you can just say whatever you want to say because that's the purpose of this confidential communication. And now, um, by sharing that um, as a means of the uh, journalist, but um, in a kind of leaked way, so it feels like those journalists kind of trying to spy on those people and then try to broadcast the uh, private conversation to the public audience. So um, what? That means to the audience um, could be that this audience will feel this conversation as a sincere content um, being shared between two people, and then um, and because that's the purpose of this um, you know uh, private messenger, but these photographs are actually being shared on you know mass social or mass media. So um, you are um, saying certain things. Um, publicly, but um, giving them sense that this was actually originally shared in private channel. So what you could do is um, you are literally saying the same thing, but then um, you know, the, uh, get the uh, much higher level of um, uh, you know, um, perceptual honesty um, or trustworthiness. 
And, and, and of course, that uh, we here, we assume that actually um, those um, uh, messages are actually leaked on purpose. So, um, uh, um, you know, because it, it'll make sense, right? So if you, if this is just kind of randomly leaked uh, messages, um, you kind of can't control um, or wouldn't want to control how this will uh, be filled and perceived from the audience. But, um, um, you know, in most of cases, um, um, you know, those kind of uh, media footage and photographs and many things are staged. And then um, those are not kind of random, um, you know, leaks. So it's um, usually, you know, same angle, same distance, and then really large font. So it's usually um, staged. Although, um, you know, we don't know for sure, but um, um, so these people, politicians and media are trying to um, craft some complicated version of communication um, through multiple layers and multiple windows. So then what would be the um, perception and what would be the impact to the voters? And then what is um, um, the structure of this communication and how does this work? So that's very inter interesting um, questions that uh, people can ask in um, you know, communication. Um, and I don't know if anybody in communication is actually working on something like this, but I'm, I'm just saying that um, the, um, the, there are very, um, you know, complex and nuanced um, communication activities. And then we want to understand that um, because this is um, essentially um, how um, human communication is governed and controlled. Um, <clears throat> So um, going back to AI and machine learning. So, um, so what, what, um, uh, why does it matter to um, um, you guys? Um, you're not in communication or, or social science. You are uh, in engineering, uh, many things. So, um, and then the the what what can matter, I think, is something like this. And obviously, there will be some social scientists and computational social scientists who, you know, go on the Twitter and then the um, cable news and try to grab the, all the photographs that capture smartphones and try to uh, use, um, uh, uh, you know, OCR and then try to do some um, text analysis. But I think the um, implication and messages and the lessons are um, much um, bigger and broader than that. And then it's really um, uh, relevant to um, all of us because um, the, um, the, when, when you think of the companies like you know, Facebook, Google, Twitter, and uh, um, those are the companies that um, highly uh, capitalize on the development and usage of AI, but um, <clears throat> at the same time, they are kind of media and information tech companies, meaning um, they develop some services to facilitate human communication. And then um, there are certain principles and then, um, you know, rules. Um, some of them are known to us, some of them may be uh, unknown, but um, um, in um, order to uh, be successful, in uh, making and developing those services. I think it's very important to understand the uh, kind of the principles and then, and then the um, kind of the code um, and then the human perception about communication itself. So, um, you know, and then look at the Facebook and Twitter again. Um, so those companies had a lot of competitors when they started, but um, um, they're kind of um, thrived much more than their competitors. Um, and then uh, why? Why, um, how can we um, explain their successes? Um, and some of them may be you know, technical, so they may have developed better solutions, cheaper solutions to uh, maintain their services and then make a better apps. But I think <clears throat> there are um, you know, the important uh, choices that they made in order to make a better interface, the interface between users and their systems. And then uh, what I want to do um, is um, um, to really design those um, better interfaces between humans and AIs. And again, these humans could be AI researchers and AI could be uh, models or data sets. So what would be the um, better tools for us to develop models? Uh, because right now, again, what we um, do is um, to have um, a really big data set, and then um, there are a lot of um, data instances and labels, and then um, the, the data set is so big, and we can't even um, host them in a um, single computer. So most of them um, time, they will be sitting in some you know remote server, and then our 
you know, uh, computation is also being done in some remote machine and we don't know where they are. So we're kind of losing direct control um, for those um, computing devices and data, uh, which I personally don't like. But um, um, that's obviously um, the trend and then um, the you know, kind of low level and fundamental level of um, computation uh, may need to be done that way um, because again, the data and models are getting bigger and bigger. But on, um, at some level, um, either intermediate or high level, um, I think um, there should be some better interfaces for researchers to understand um, how the system really work. And then also um, how uh, we can kind of instruct these models to perform what we want them to perform. Um, so, um, and another thing um, is, um, um, so I'm, uh, my main um, expertise is still in computer vision. So, um, and so most of my projects are related to, um, you know, uh, rely on those uh, visual modality or a multiple modality. So you use a visual or text uh, or, or audio and any other cues. So um, those are um, important um, directions of my research. So, um, okay, yeah. So, um, again, I spend a lot of time to just talk about um, why um, I'm interested in those things. So, uh, again, feel free to ask any questions. Um, uh, any, the, um, I mean, maybe you still need to um, have some more content. So, um, let's kind of quickly um, go through um, those projects that I um, prepared. So the, uh, well, there are many different uh, modalities um, involved in human communication, but um, I have been focusing on face and gestures, um, you know, those visual cues. And um, specifically, I wanna talk uh, mostly about human faces and then um, how human faces are perceived and then um, what kinds of signals do we uh, encode in our faces, and then, um, you know, what are the uh, mathematical and computational tools to infer those signals, and then what are the, uh, the you know, issues um, like bias or fairness um, in those, um, um, you know, research questions and resources. So those are the things that I um, wanted to talk about. So one, um, um, line of work that we've been doing um, is uh, to try to um, understand the usage of a nonverbal communication in human communication. So this nonverbal communication include, you know, facial expressions or gestures um, and like, you know, pointing um, or, you know, you have an angry face or sad face. So um, those cues um, that are delivered um, through visual channel, um, but um, still contribute to the communication and conversation. Uh, and then obviously if you see uh, movies or, or TV shows and there are a lot of people who are using, you know, those um, emotions, expression and gestures, and then um, does it matter or not? It of course does matter because um, that will change the, um, you know, your perception and your understanding of a scene and then status of those actors. And then those things are very common in um, any kinds of face-to-face -face or uh, mass media, um, you know, communication setting. So one example um, here is um, the political debate. So political debate is um, you know huge event and um, you know kind of big. Uh, televised show um, in you know many countries and then um, people um, you know politicians they of course um, say a lot of things um, they speak and then um, they discuss and argue about their policies and then you know um, have some argument with the um, their opponents but um, um, they're also seen on screen and then what they do is um, you know try to look better they kind of try to look more smart and then more um, credible and more um, competent. And there are just so many, uh, probably more than 10,000 articles published to date about um, the impact of the visual appearance and then the facial and gesture, um, those nonverbal cues on the voter perception. And then uh, a lot of research actually suggests that human voters, the you know just ordinary citizens, um, their opinions are more heavily swayed by the way those candidates look than um, what they say. 
Um, so simply speaking, we don't really care about what they say, but uh, we care about um, how they look, what they look and what they do on screen. So um, you know, what we wanted to do is, um, was um, to try to systematically analyze those behaviors using computer vision. And then here, um, you know, we use some uh, open polls um, you know, uh, um, uh, done by Professor Ju, and then the um, other um, famous and reliable computer vision tools and models to automatically detect the face and then the you know, body postures at every frame, um, and then try to uh, measure what is um, the you know perceptual um, you know emotion or credibility or emotional intensity um, automatically, and then try to match that with the actual voter perception. Here, the voter perception was measured by the difference between the um, you know the candidate support, uh, the actual um, poll data before and after the uh, you know each debate. So whatever difference that you see after the you know, debate um, could have been attributed to the, um, the actual debate performance. Um, and what we found was, um, again, the, um, so what they say, like topic um, wise um, or the word choice um, didn't matter as much as um, some of those non-mobile communication cues. Um, and then we um, have some machine learning uh, models to automatically, uh, um, you know, detect those things and then um, try to um, kind of report um, in a systematic way, so in, a, in a way. So the, uh, and this is a very, um, you know, popular way of using machine learning and, um, you know, deep learning tools um, for social science research questions. And then um, the, um, the field of social science and they had um, their own challenge um, because, <clears throat> Uh, you know, many of their works and findings are really hard to reproduce and then, um, you know, hard to verify. So, um, and it's the set of scholars are trying to be more um, using quantitative tools and then those computational resources. And then um, the uh, one challenge that they have, um, especially scholars who are working in the uh, non-verbal communication field is the data that they have, they have is on visual and audio and it's very difficult to um, automate, uh, automatically analyze. So, um, so they've been adapting those tools developed from you know, computer science and machine learning literature and then kind of do more kind of scalable and more objective analysis. That's kind of one way of intellection um, that we can foster between computer science and social science and any other domains really. Um, so that's kind of one um, example. The another example um, of um, using gestures and you know um, is um, um, for the um, robotics um, for um, collaborative robots specifically. And then the um, and this um, paper um, was actually done in um, VR setting um, because um, um, uh, because of the reason that I will talk shortly. But um, um, so we use a VR, and then what we wanted to do here was um, to try to uh, train an agent using um, uh, natural languages and then also the um, gestures. So um, so you want your robot to understand your gestures and uh, instructions and then perform the work that um, you want it to do. Um, so there are many ways um, um, to do that, but um, um, so usually what people would do is I'm trying to define some vocabulary and then uh, vocabulary of um, um, you know, some gestures like you know, um, you know, pointing or stop or you know, hand. Uh, shaking or waving. So the, um, and then, you know, give specific meanings to each of those gestures and then, um, and then train a, you know, hand gesture classifier that the, um, um, you know, what I can use. Um, but um, the limitation of those approaches, um, the meaning of the human gestures are predefined. And that's, um, you know, um, very limiting because um, if you think of the way that we use the human, you know, gestures to communicate with other people, um, the meanings of gestures are not really pretty fine. It's really continuous and then it's non-discrete. And then um, it's highly uh, context and situational, uh, situation dependent. And then um, you can't just define the, um, the, the meaning of these gestures. You have to learn the combination of the given task and situation and then the human gestures. So how do you do it? 
because um, it's almost like unbounded problem. So uh, what we did um, here was to use um, the framework of the reinforcement learning. Here we define task of the, um, you know, the indoor navigation for um, virtual um, agent for embedded learning. This is actually pretty well um, established sub area in machine learning and um, most computer vision community. Um, and then people have using have been using you know uh, the simulation framework and 3D environment, and then um, we uh, of course could use um, the actual robot, but um, um, of course that will require us to um, you know repeat a lot of experiments um, to train better models, and that was um, a little bit difficult for our case because um, uh, we had a human um, users. Uh, that need to actually interact with the um, agent and models um, all the time. So, so we use them VR um, to kind of emulate the situation for collaboration. So, um, so I think there are kind of two different goals um, that complement each other here. So uh, one is um, how, um, you know, how can you teach your agent to understand your um, communication, I mean, your languages. And here the languages include both the um, you know, speech and also gestures or anything that you can um, you know, encode and then send to the agent. So how can you understand that automatically? Um, and then the, and how to actually perform the work, right? So you know, if you instruct your robot to um, do certain things like clean the you know, area here, then actually it needs to clean there, right? So, and then um, in the our framework is actually um, pretty straightforward. And then you can actually imagine those two goals are actually helping each other. So, um, and then what we actually showed in this paper was actually it is possible to uh, learn the um, those hidden meanings of the human languages um, um, in the um, specific context and situation that we designed. So of course, if you change the situation, it would not you know, generalize to the novel situation. So um, if you point, um, you know, certain um, position in the room and then say that, you know, clean there, that pointing is different from, um, you know, other things like if I point, um, you know, a person uh, in class and then, you know, initiate the conversation, that's, you know, pretty different. And then, and then there may be some certain, um, um, differences um, um, between um, those um, different gestures. So, but in this uh, specific scope, we were able to actually learn and then kind of demonstrate this um, Asian was able to kind of comprehend the meaning of human gestures. And then the way that we verify and evaluate um, how much it understood was um, through the, you know, the actual, um, you know, standard uh, loss function and also the success rate. Meaning, um, you know, if I communicate the message clearly to the agent and if the agent was able to understand um, my message, then the agent will perform the work um, as instructed. So, um, right, so that's one um, project um, that will involve you know, human gestures and communication and also AI and reinforcement learning and robot learning. So um, I have a question here. Um, I think the way people make gestures might be different from culture um, to people. I wonder how to deal with the problem that communication is different. Yeah, absolutely. So those, um, you know, gestures, um, highly, uh, you know, uh, culture dependent. So um, it doesn't translate to other cultures. It's pretty much the same as um, um, the actual natural language. So, um, and then, um, and, and maybe gestures and facial patients are more universal than, um, you know, the natural language, but um, the, um, the um, still there are um, very peculiar features and also individuals use some different, um, you know, styles of gestures. Some people don't use gestures. Some people just, you know, like to just, um, you know, sit still and then just talk. Um, so how do you um, deal with those variations? Like one way is of course you um, have a diverse set of um, you know, examples in your training set, right? So, and then you uh, let your agent um, be exposed to diverse set of um, people to intellect. And then, and then you kind of develop, uh, you know, different styles of um, gestures um, in your model internally. And then the, um, another way of course um, is to um, have a better models. Um, and here, better models doesn't mean, you know, uh, better um, CNN architectures, but it's a better model of human communication, meaning to know um, when 
and how and why human use gestures in a specific way. And that will lead to um, kind of, you know, better modeling and then better understanding uh, and, and better predictions of um, human gesture and its meaning. And then um, there is, um, you know, um, uh, you know, big uh, literature of, um, you know, cold speech, uh, um, you know, detection and understanding. And then the, what they do is I'm um, trying to understand the meaning of gestures in association with the actual language that um, they're speaking. And that itself, of course, um, you know, means those are not universal, but um, um, still, um, there are many um, common features and then the common um, combination. And then um, it is very interesting question to, uh, um, to kind of have a, a model that can generalize to a new culture. And then the, um, and what we showed here in this paper um, partially is um, that actually we can um, start from scratch and then teach the Asian learn the meaning of gestures because that will be just given from the um, task and then we work. Um, so yeah, thank you for the question. And then the, um, so we'll move on. Um, so, and, uh, because we don't have much time, I will skip some of the content. But um, um, you know, we have robots, and then you know, robot will, you know, collaborate and interact with the human users kind of more naturally uh, without collision. So again, you know, you want to understand the um, the predict the intent, and then the uh, human users and then where this person is um, uh, trying to reach out. Um, so, and then try to incorporate those predictions in your planning um, as a um, um, way to develop kind of better um, collaborative robots. That's another um, area that we've been uh, working on. The, um, the other, um, studies that we've been doing um, is um, trying to um, analyze the social media data using computer vision and deep learning tools. And then the, um, again, I don't want to go uh, too deep into these topics, but um, um, you know, if you um, have a lot of data um, um, collected from those um, um, you know, social media accounts of politicians, we can try to um, you know, detect those objects like people and then um, classify their gender or, or race or age and then their activities and try to understand what these um, politicians are trying to communicate to their supporters. So, uh, and, and then there is um, um, actually a um, pretty big difference between you know, gender groups or you know, political parties. Um, and then um, we can identify those um, visual features um, and, and using the tools that we already have. And then these tools are being adapted by social scientists more um, and more frequently. And then um, we can do you know, many interesting analysis. Now, this is an example where these AI models are being used as kind of diagnostic um, tools, um, diagnostic and also analytic tools to um, understand the uh, media behavior and you know, political communication. So I think this is um, um, Another application of face um, and also gesture um, um, prediction models and also um, general image classification and you know, activity recognition, many things can be applied to there. Um, and then, you know, there are kind of better ways um, to uh, support these um, goals. Um, and then if we have enough time, then I can also talk about that um, uh, later. So another, um, Important question um, that I want to um, bring up is um, the you know the question of um, bias, um, fairness, and um, trustworthiness. Uh, many things, those equity equity concerns about AI um, uh, to the community, um, and this is important um, for many reasons. So I mean, this itself is a kind of well established research field, and then getting you know, more attention in. Um, you know, community like you know, research community in computer vision and machine learning. Um, but when you use um, those computer vision tools as um, analytic tools for your own research, so you're, you want your tool to be, uh, um, you know, less biased, right? Because otherwise your analysis based on um, computer vision models would not be accurate. 
So um, that's very, you know, technical reason rather than social uh, motivation. The, um, and, and then for example, you want to compare the, um, you know, emotions expressed among people that appear in social media photographs of um, um, female politician versus male politicians. You obviously want your smile classifier, uh, you know, is not biased and equally well classifying the people's expressions. And that um, was um, usually not the case uh, reported by some, um, you know, papers and auditing works. And then, you know, there are many people um, try to uh, um, test commercial and public classifiers using some small um, scale data set. And then, um, and then what they showed was, uh, well, there's a huge difference and then the gap of the accuracy between demographic people, demographic groups of people. So these classifiers uh, would work a lot better on the white population than the uh, non-white population. And why? Um, you know, potentially because those um, data set that we use to train those models are also biased. And that is again because um, um, those Western uh, countries and um, kind of have more uh, access to um, the internet and then you know um, many things. So it's not very difficult to understand the um, those um, connection. Um, so that's kind of the non-issue. And then the um, also the um, I think this is also related to the way that we've been uh, making progress in machine learning in general. And then the way that we've been doing is trying to define um, um, tasks and subtasks, and then um, try to define a you know, small data set. And by small, I mean, the scope is small, not the quantity. Quantity is um, you know, um, you know, huge. So we have a million or 10 million, 100 million instance in the data set. The data set um, has very, narrow scope and can be applied to, you know, really a small set of problems. So, and then in the real um, world, the real world application, what we have to do is to assemble um, several components together. So for example, for a phase analysis, so what you have to do, uh, phase analysis like gender classification, you can't just do um, gender classification. You first need to detect any phase in a uh, photographs and then you need to align them and then you need to do actual classification at the end. The um, problem is actually there are separate data sets. So you use some data set for, um, you know, um, the um, base section, the another data set for alignment, another data set for classification. And then they are very different. Um, they have very different distributions and then, um, you know, they look very um, different. So what that means is actually, um, it could be very difficult to um, know where the model will fail because um, uh, when you are, developing and evaluating the last module in this pipeline, which is classification, uh, your data set uh, may be um, you know, uh, way too easy. And then um, in the weird situation scenario uh, where you are using kind of um, more recent detector that will detect um, occluded or profile face or any you know, challenging um, examples, those, are, those faces will be added in your you know, unknown test cases and that your classifier will not be able to handle that. And then the, the um, you know, situation is pretty simple, but uh, we just didn't know because um, again, we usually do not um, cross validate the models um, across different tasks or different data set. And that is actually a pretty well-known situation in computer and machine learning community. Um, but um, people didn't pay um, you know, too much attention until we were kind of forced to um, take care of it because um, there were kind of huge um, you know, blames and then critics will say, well, you, the you know, whole model is biased and then you have to do something. So um, there are many things that um, the community um, in doing. Um, so again, yeah, I, I think I wanna uh, finish this uh, maybe in the next, five to 10 minutes. So I'll just, you know, go through um, the um, series of um, 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 the projects and papers that we um, have recently published. But, um, you know, again, feel free to ask questions, um, um, you know, in the middle or at the end. So the first thing that um, we um, have done is to try to make a better data set. 
because uh, well, we, we know the data sets are problematic. So, um, and then we can make a better data set and then the, um, that may solve the problem. And then the data set um, has um, uh, mainly two purposes. Um, so one is to train better models. And in this case, better models means you know, fairer models um, that has um, better representations of um, um, you know, all the um, racial or gender minorities. Uh, and then the uh, second purpose is um, to evaluate the existing classifiers. So um, if you want to um, actually test how biased your model is, so you need you know, relatively well-controlled data set, uh, you know, sizable um, data set um, that can serve as a benchmark. So, um, so that was um, kind of um, one thing um, that we did for uh, face attribute classification and another work uh, we did the same thing for face detection. So, um, and this was um, uh, done um, um, uh, in my work at Amazon. So um, we wanted to address this problem of the bias in pipeline where um, these models will start from one module, in this case, face detection. And then this bias will kind of be accumulated in the pipeline and develop at the, uh, the down downstream task like a recognition or classification. So we um, made another data set um, of the, um, the, um, the face attributes such as gender and skin tone and age, and then you know, try to mitigate those biases. Um, and we use um, you know, some you know, standard method for uh, um, bias mitigation that includes um, um, you know, uh, re-weighting and also adversarial learning and many things. Those um, techniques actually work reasonably well um, as long as you have some you know, reasonably well collected and controlled data set. So it's, um, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, at least uh, one large part of the problem is the awareness issue. So people are not aware of certain, uh, such issue and then it kind of makes it hard to uh, fix the issue. Um, so that's kind of more uh, um, data set um, uh, driven solution. And then the another thing is that we need to understand uh, what is causing the problem. And then here, um, there are many different ways, but um, 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 here, uh, this particular one, we use um, the, the um, counterfactual example, uh, which is generated from another computational model. So, so you could imagine you can use something like GAN uh, or encoder decoder so that you can directly um, modify the uh, certain cues in the uh, facial content, such as gender cues or racial cues, skin tone, and then directly test the um, changes in the model output. So if you use um, um, you know, some um, female version of the same um, original face and then your um, model for uh, profession classification is affected by the change that you just made, then um, the um, then you can actually say, well, the model is actually um, responding to that cue directly. So then, you know, you can do um, the um, right remedy to um, mitigate those biases. And also, of course, you can use the same technique um, to um, actively um, avoid those um, um, spurious correlation in representation learning in training. Um, the um, another thing that we've done um, is try to um, understand the uh, potential biases from annotators. So in most um, supervised learning, so we use um, annotations and labels provided by humans. And the for and for tasks like facial expression classification, uh, we need um, annotators, um, typically multiple annotators inputs about the facial expression of the other people. And that's not always accurate. And then there is research saying that actually we um, perceive different emotions uh, from different groups of people who um, actually are showing the same facial expressions um, based on their gender or race um, or any other cues. So there's already you know, good amount of research showing that effect. And then um, you can also imagine that um, you know same effect can be found in the uh, most of the facial expression recognition data set that we use to train those models. And then you know those models are used for you know bunch of different applications. And then if you do fairness analysis using the data set, uh, you may not find anything because the, um, in this case the biases are in the data set, the annotations. 
So if you compare the you know accuracy disparity or spirit correlation, then you may not get anything because um, it's the labels that are biased, right? So you don't have references. Um, so in this case, we um, use a facial action units, so which uh, measure the, the presence or absence of a specific muscle movement of, of the, uh, on the facial movement and the you know, facial um, expression. And this was uh, specifically developed for the purpose of the objective uh, uh, face, face analysis um, by psychologists. So we use that facial action unit um, to define the, you know, the similarity between the faces and then we kind of enforce um, those um, individual fairness, meaning you know, if your facial expression, if your facial action units are similar to um, somebody else, then, then you guys must have the, or similar facial expression, right? So that's another additional constraint that we enforce and then that was able to um, mitigate and then the address the biases of the models. Um, compared to the other uh, popular mitigation strategies, because those strategies assume your labels are correct and accurate and unbiased. So you need to choose the right uh, method and then, um, and then um, oh, sometimes also find the unbiased source, uh, unbiased uh, feature sources. Um, so I think I'll just skip the remaining um, papers because um, uh, we don't have much time left. So um, the conclusion is, um, so um, there um, is um, um, wide opportunity and very interesting areas um, to explore um, in the intersection between AI, computer vision, machine learning, and also um, social science communication and many things. Um, and um, I think it's, um, um, you know, really interesting and uh, um, uh, really also, um, you know, important for uh, many people to actually look at those um, um, interdisciplinary collaboration. And then um, from there, we could um, really generate uh, big ideas rather than focus on, uh, uh, you know, small incremental work. Um, and then the, um, the addressing these issues of fairness and biases um, is um, very important. And then this is um, actually uh, particularly concerning if you, you um, uh, work at companies because those companies are uh, under heavy uh, pressures to, um, you know, convince their customers and the policymakers and media that they are doing um, every effort to ensure their products are not discriminating, um, you know, some customers actually, you know, heavy uh, focus uh, are being made on those things. And this is obviously important mission that the um, AI community uh, should take on because, um, you know, otherwise um, there will be, you know, uh, uh, you know consequences and you know, other people, um, you know, social scientists and then the uh, policymakers will, start blaming and then regularizing uh, many things. And as a result, actually, um, we are seeing um, some of the outcomes um, um, already, like uh, uh, you know, taking down data sets and then um, there are kind of more and more um, restrictions about you know, using and developing machine learning models, which may be good, uh, but um, in some cases, those are uh, unnecessary. Um, if we could actually show um, you know, those models and data sets or um, uh, um, you know, sort of you know, pass a certain test. So uh, we will need to um, you know, make those efforts. Um, so yes, um, if you have any questions, of course, I am, you know, I'm happy to take right now, but, um, if you have any other questions, um, um, you know, you can always send me an email, um, and then you know, we'll find some time to chat. So yeah, thank you very much.